Well, we are still missing one panelist, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to session three of uh, Hamilton versus Jefferson, Republican government. I thought we might, yesterday's discussion was, uh, I thought was wonderful, very, pretty much tightly focused on uh, questions of policy, questions of, of history. Um, and I thought we might start because one of the things that uh, we learned from Federalist Number 10 is among the various um, causes of faction. One is an attachment to different leaders ambitiously contending for uh, power and preeminence. And we haven't really talked about sort of the, the personal dimension of the Hamilton versus uh, Jefferson. And there are a couple of interesting letters from Hamilton, if I can put my finger on them right now, that deal with, one deals with um, Hamilton's changing relationship with James Madison, and the other offers Hamilton's um, thumbnail sketch of Thomas Jefferson and also a thumbnail sketch of Aaron Burr. I'm not going to ask anything about Aaron Burr, but let me, <laughs> let me find the quotes that I wanted to use, and we'll get started. In the letter to um, Edward Carrington from May of 1792, Hamilton writes <clears throat> um, that he had assumed that he and James Madison were in sync on various policy matters. And then he discovered that uh, when I accepted this office, I now hold it was under a full persuasion that from similarity of thinking, conspiring with personal goodwill, I should have the firm support of Mr. Madison in the general course of my administration. Aware of the intrinsic difficulties of the situation and the powers of Mr. Madison, I did not believe I should have accepted under different supposition. But he learns, to his chagrin, that he and Madison are not uh, in concert on many issues. On the second page of this letter, he says, it was not till the last session that I became unequivocally convinced of the following truth, that Mr. Madison cooperating with Mr. Jefferson is at the head of a faction decidedly hostile to me and my administration and actuated by views in my judgment subversive to the principles of good government and dangerous to the union, peace, and happiness of the country. And at the end of this letter, he offers, I'm trying to find it, I apologize for my difficulty in locating what I want. Um, um, he characterizes Jefferson as a man of profound ambition and violent passions. And um, in a later letter, let me find that now. I'm, I apologize again. Mm -hmm. In his letter to James Bayard in January of 1801, he offers a, what I would call a mixed um, view of mixed view of uh, Jefferson, and he concludes that, um, to my mind, a true estimate of Mr. J's character warrants the expectation of a temporizing rather than a violent system, that Jefferson has manifested a culpable predilection for France is certainly true, but I think it a question whether 
it did not proceed quite as much from her popularity among us as from sentiment, and in proportion as that popularity is diminished, his zeal will cool. Add to this that there is no fair reason to suppose him capable of being corrupted, which is security that he will not go beyond certain limits. It is not at all improbable that under the change of circumstances, Jefferson Gallicalism has considerably abated. So, how much of the battle stems from personal conflict, vying for power, that Madison points to in Federalist 10, and it gets worked out in policy difference? Or is it the reverse? Are they deeply divided in terms of fundamentals of philosophy and government? And that fundamental difference leads to personal animosity, if there is personal animosity. The floor is open, and I'm going to announce each speaker, partly because our cameramen have a harder job today, uh, because they're going to actually have to move the camera to focus in on speakers. So uh, please raise your hand, and I will keep a cue, as I did yesterday, and, and we'll begin. The personalities of, and we'll include James Madison in this. Um, Joanne. Um, I will mention one or two letters that aren't in our packet because then I think that they'll, they'll lend themselves to part of the answer here. And that is, it's kind of striking when you look at some of the letters that Hamilton writes to Jefferson when Jefferson first arrives, they're actually kind of friendly. You know, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Um, so I think initially they had no reason really to mm -hmm. dislike each other. I think in some of the readings for this week you can see, for this session I mean, you can see um, that it's partly policy and it's partly, to use his words, manner and style, right? He thinks that uh, Jefferson doesn't respect him. Jefferson smiles and looks smug when something goes against him. I think, I think it's the buildup of policy and the direction of policy on the part of Hamilton that upsets Jefferson. And then I think it's that dynamic that then moves on to push both of them into having much stronger feelings about each other. Carson. Yeah, I would say I agree that, or I believe that, uh, the difference is primarily political. I don't think they disliked each other for personal reasons, but they did come to dislike each other because of politics. And there's a passage, I can't put my finger on it, but it's really interesting in the Carrington letter where Hamilton talks about what he thinks are the extreme and unreasonable accusations against him and his party by Madison and Jefferson, um, aims to destroy state government, to establish a monarchy and things like this. And he talks about their sincerity. I think the letter to Carrington is pretty astute piece of political psychology, or at least has a lot of interesting political psychology in it, whether or not it's accurate in its judgments about Ham uh, Madison and Jefferson. What Hamilton says is they may have come to believe what they've sported to deceive others, because where the passions are heated, people will believe anything. And I think it's pretty interesting. I mean. I think of that about politics today, too. I mean, you see politicians behave in different ways and say things different from what they said earlier. Are they just hypocrites? I think Hamilton thinks, and I tend to think, no, not really. They've convinced themselves of the truth of these things. Um, it's easy to believe all manner of evil of other people when they stand for things that you don't believe in in the first place. I think Hamilton's kind of thinking that that's what's going on in Jefferson's mind and Madison's mind. Um, he doesn't diagnose himself, to my knowledge, but uh, maybe something like that was going on in his mind, too, with regard to them. John Ragosta and then Brad. Uh, thank you. I, you know, I think uh, this is actually a broader issue, and it's important to keep in mind. Uh, Jefferson violently disagrees with Madison on political matters. He violently disagrees with John Adams on political matters, but it's never personal. Um, it is political, and in fact, we know that he reconciles with Adams. He, he, you know, understands that we're going to have a political discourse which is going to be violent, but that's not personal. Uh, and I owe to Jeff Looney one thing to throw in. Jeff has pointed out to me very important in the Annis. In about 1793, Jefferson is writing, and he's writing down all of these scurrilous, gossipy stories, and he, he writes down a story, 
and um, it was that Rufus King, Alexander Hamilton, and someone else, some of these high Federalists, had a deal from England that if the country fell apart, they would have sinecures in England. They could go back to England and basically be taken care of. And so they were obviously traitors against American interests. At some point um, later, probably in the teens, Jefferson drops a footnote and says, this is impossible as to Hamilton. He was far above that. So, you know, the, the, there, there is a wreck. Now, maybe that comes later for Jefferson. Maybe it was convenient that that occurs after Burr kills Hamilton, you know, that enemy of my enemy. Um, but they did understand the difference. A lot of people know I, I work a lot with Patrick Henry. Jefferson hated Patrick Henry. Mm -hmm. That was personal. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that had uh, actually in some ways little to do with politics per se. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, they, a, a very important lesson for today, perhaps, that they understood one could violently disagree, but that wasn't, uh, that was politics. Brad, or, um, yeah, Brad. Yes, uh, I, I think Hamilton's letter to Carrington is very rich. Uh, it, it, it deals with personalities, it deals with uh, politics, um, ways of governing, uh, but I think at least one of the fundamental disagreements uh, underlying it all is between Hamilton's, under, Ham, Hamilton's belief that the, ma that the major task of the new government is to unify the country and subordinate the states to national uh, governing over those objects uh, that the Constitution gives to the national government. And he believes that Jefferson thinks that the major threat to the Union is from uh, the central government as opposed to the individual states going their own way, claiming sovereignty for themselves and so forth. And what seems to really dismay Hamilton is that he thought Madison was with him on this uh, at the time of the convention and then the, the uh, Federalist Papers. He was persuaded that Madison and he thought alike, that the real threat to the Union came from state power, not from central national power. And uh, the kind of disappointment that he shows in Madison, he's not disappointed in Jefferson because he never expected him to think otherwise. But with Madison, he's disappointed because he thought Madison agreed with him on this. And he believes that the friendship between Jefferson and Madison somehow drew Madison away from his earlier nationalism uh, to a support of state power. And I would only just add to that that this is reinforced in Hamilton's mind by the uh, 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 Virginia and Kentucky resolutions at the time of the Alien and Sedition Acts, uh, which he obviously uh, was alarmed at the position being laid out in those documents and uh, went so far as to think that the, that the Virginians were actually arming themselves to engage in some sort of effort to uh, 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 triumph over, over the North. So, yeah. Peter and then Colleen. Well, that's a great question. Oh, sorry. A great question you started with, Steve. Uh, and I like the quote you read including the reference to my administration. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you read more of Hamilton, you see that governance is administration. Uh, and of course, that has uh, historical resonances that are very upsetting to real Whig types. Uh, and that is that um, it's through the treasury that uh, Hamilton means to rule and of course, the corruption of the British Constitution came through the Exchequer, through the management of the Treasury. Uh, and so he's positioning himself as the second coming of Robert Walpole. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, let's say it, it's, there's a problem with, uh, we now say optics, this doesn't look too good. And I think it's amazing how clueless 
Hamilton is about appearances. Uh, because the real problem has to do with legitimacy. Is this our government? Madison had experienced the uh, ratification of the Constitution as, uh, as la the late Lance Banning put it, as a learning experience. Uh, one of the things he learned, and Jefferson was uh, more than whispering in his ear uh, over the course of, uh, uh, of the constitutional ratification period, uh, was that the Constitution has to be understood uh, in terms of uh, the upshot of the debate, which is the states are very much part of the regime, a central part of the regime, and they, they have to be respected for the protective function. They're, they're central to the Constitution. They protect the rights of the people. Um, and uh, Hamilton doesn't worry about the optics or the politics, about pleasing the anti-federalists. Uh, and the short story is that Madison is acutely aware of the promises that were made to opponents of the Constitution, especially in Virginia. So I think you can blame it to some extent on Virginia, uh, his uh, hypersensitivity to how the Constitution was so narrowly ratified. Uh, and there, there has to be good faith in the, uh, uh, the new government. But Hamilton simply takes the ratification of the Constitution as a license for him to administer. Uh, he's so uh, contemptuous of the popular participation that his basic formula is, Madison, you're my lieutenant uh, in the House. You can manage it. And what we're going to do is establish an effective administration. We're going to solve the basic problem, the fiscal military problem. And uh, we're going to have a state that people will um, be satisfied with. And it will lead to confidence, a key word. The, the people will be happy with the government because they're being governed well. Uh, whereas Jefferson will later tell us, later tell us that uh, confidence is the road to def despotism. Uh, it's the opposite of vigilance. It means you simply accept, oh, the government's OK, and they do anything they want. Uh, I think it's very, very personal at this point. But what's remarkable is how insensitive Hamilton is to the way he thinks he can manage the regime and, in effect, uh, write the Constitution. That is, the document doesn't really matter. It's administration that matters. And uh, anybody who opposes his administration is uh, opposing the government. And uh, all hell will break loose. We now have a healthy queue, so let me read the list. Colleen, Michael, Joanne, Doug, and Kevin. Colleen? Yeah, I think that um, Peter's comments um, about Hamilton uh, focusing on administration is really important to understand what Hamilton is up to. We like to quote uh, Pope, you know, of forms of government let fools contest that government which is best administered is best. And that wasn't at all the way Jefferson or Madison approached this. Um, I find this letter to Carrington, uh, I mean, Hamilton is frustrated. And talk about somebody whose passions are getting the best of him at this moment. He is, well, he's, he's upset. He's got a job to do. Um, he's looking at America, and he's saying, you know, if anybody else were in this position, they would be doing the same thing. This is so critical to the future of the country. Um, and they just don't understand what's required. I mean, America's a Hercules, but a Hercules in the cradle. We have work to do. Um, and if we don't, if we don't, if we don't do this, um, um, it's a fledgling nation. There's no guarantee, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be here in a few years. Um, uh, they haven't solved the problems yet that they were experiencing in the 1780s. But having said that, he's trying to figure out Madison, and I don't. I, I think he's he's really trying to struggle because and understand what, what's going on with Madison, that Madison did, you know, argue that the problem is particularly at the state level with the factions at the state level. But I don't think Hamilton understand, understood Madison. And I don't, I think he comes to understand him better later on throughout the, the 1790s. But 
that's part of what Madison is up to, the problem of factions at the state level to prevent you know, the rule of majority faction. But there's this whole other side of Madison's solution. And Hamilton doesn't understand it. I'm not sure Madison totally gets it either because the earth, I'm sorry, Jefferson, because the earth belongs to the living uh, theory that he holds on to throughout his life um, is really shows that he's not understanding the ongoing sovereignty of public opinion the way Madison is understanding it. According to, so, so what happens is in the fall of um, 17, actually the spring of, of 1791 into the fall, Madison is already frustrated with all of this and he's working on uh, these notes um, to understand Republican government even more fully than he did in the Federalist Papers and working out his theory of public opinion even more because the problem now is Hamilton, minority faction. Um, because Ham in Madison's mind, because um, it really matters how the people understood the Constitution that they ratified because they are the sovereign voice, not the administrators in government. And so, as he'll write in the fall of 1791, um, um, uh, public opinion is, is the only real sovereign in every free government. And Hamilton just isn't, isn't, isn't getting that. And, and the one other thing I just want to say is a, a footnote. This interpretation of Madison, that he was um, a Hamiltonian in the 1780s and then became a Jeffersonian in the 1790s. This all comes from Hamilton, and it's not accurate. Um, Madison was never a Hamiltonian, and Madison was never a Jeffersonian. Madison was a Madisonian. <laughs> Michael and then Joanne. Okay. I, actually, what I wanted to say is uh, direct uh, uh, in continuity with and complementary to, I think, of what uh, both Peter and Colleen have just said. Um, I, I, I'm, I, was struck, I was struck in reading this by a certain theme that kept recurring in it, this, the Carrington letter, which is such a wonderful, such a wonderful letter. So I'm just going to read a few passages to people. Um, I know not everybody read this manuscript quite as much as uh, we were supposed to. But anyway, at the bottom of the first page of the Carrington letter, he says, at this time and afterwards, repeated intimations were given to me that Mr. Madison, from a spirit of rivalship or some other cause, became personally unfriendly to me. And one gentleman in particular, whose honor I have no reason to doubt, assured me that Mr. Madison, in a conversation with him, had made a pretty direct attempt to insinuate unfavorable impressions of me. On page two towards the bottom, with regard to Mr. Madison, the matter stands thus. I have not heard but in one instance to which I have alluded of his having held language unfriendly to me in private conversation, but in his public conduct there has been a more uniform and persevering opposition than I have been able to resolve into a sincere difference of opinion. I cannot persuade myself that Mr. Madison and I, whose politics had formerly been, had, so, had formerly so much the same point of departure, the point Colleen was making, Hamilton's view, that he and Madison had agreed completely before when it should have been obvious to anybody that that was not correct. Um, he, he found it difficult to understand how they should now diverge so widely in our opinions of the ma matters which are proper to be pursued. Uh, and he goes on to say, the opinion I once entertained of the candor and simplicity and fairness of Mr. Madison's character has, I acknowledge, given way to a decided opinion that it is one of a peculiarly artificial and complicated kind. The problem is Madison's character. That's not, not nothing else. He says on page three, uh, towards the middle of the page, he says, uh, Madison was actuated, the bottom sentence in a paragraph in the middle there, Madison, Mr. Madison was actuated by personal and political animosity. Um, page four, Mr. Madison had always entertained an exalted opinion of the talents, knowledge, and virtues of Mr. Jefferson. Uh, and it's therefore somehow the close intimacy between them personally that's the problem. Page five, another circumstance has contributed to widening the breach, just evident beyond a question from every movement that Mr. Jefferson aims with ardent desire at the presidential chair. It's, it's Jefferson's ambition that's the problem. Um, and then, um, let's see if we need that one. Well, we can skip that one, but I think the general point 
that I'm trying to make is that Hamilton tends to see this issue as completely personal and not about public policy. That is, he refuses actually to listen to what these other folks are saying and um, personalizes the issue in this uh, uh, d difficult way because there's really no way to join the discussion if you're convinced that your opponent is just moved by personal feelings about you or uh, rivalry in one place I didn't mark. He speaks of uh, uh, envy. They're, they're, they were mad because they were having so much success. Uh, he, Hamilton, was having so much success and they were felt thwarted. So we put all that together and you see that H Hamilton is not listening to the other, the other side of the debate and therefore we're not going to have a, um, should we say, a good discussion, a good deliberative process about what's going on. Joanne and then Doug. I, I think one of the really interesting things about the Carrington letter, and it, everyone has given their little ode to the Carrington letter, it is an amazing letter. I mean, Hamilton says, I am now gonna talk about the state of parties in America, and he does that at amazing length. But the strategic thing to also know about that letter is, so Carrington is a Virginian, and this is written at the moment when the partisan differences between Hamilton and Jefferson are really beginning to rise. And Carrington has an extensive correspondence with Washington. So at the same time that I think everything that's been said is true, there's a hard politics component to it. So he's trying to send a message, they're out to get me to Virginians, and also defending himself. The end of it is, you know, I know you all think I'm not really a Republican, but I truly am a Republican. He's, he's very explicitly doing something above and beyond revealing whatever it is that, that he's revealing, he's trying to, he's coming back around to Virginians and Washington by writing that letter, so that, that gloss has to be added on top of it. Along similar lines, we've talked about um, Hamilton and public opinion, um, appearances, Hamilton and the need to appeal to the public, and I would be kind of contrary and say Hamilton thinks a lot about appearances and a lot about appealing to the public, but not in the way we would want him to, right? So he, as a matter of fact, he says um, in the letter to Duane, the first letter from this reading, um, the manner in which a thing is done has more influence than is commonly imagined. Men are governed by opinion. This opinion is as much influenced by appearances as by realities. I think he's very aware of appearances, and he wants the government, I mean, Hercules in a cradle, he wants the government to appear powerful, and that's one of the appearances he's worried about, and as far as, I'm not saying it's good, but it is what he wants, and as far as his own appearance, I mean, he certainly wants um, fame, he wants to earn reputation, but he doesn't want to be popular. I mean, he would distrust popularity, I think, so, Appearance is a complicated thing, and I think we're, we're saying he doesn't care about it. He does. It's just what he's worried about is the appearance of the power of the government, and I think the same holds true for his um, feelings about public opinion. I don't think it's so much that he isn't thinking about the need to appeal to the public. I think he realizes it has to happen. The difference between him and Jefferson is that Jefferson understands that it's the actual core foundation of things, to Hamilton, it's more like, well, this is a Republican government, so we have to appeal to the public. So now we shall do that. It's a different spirit. I mean, there's a reason why Hamilton, of all of the um, sort of leading founder folk, invests so much time and energy into writing for the public in the press. He knows that the public must be appealed to. He's not always thrilled with that, I think, and he doesn't always trust the outcome of that. But on a kind of pragmatic level, he's aware that that must happen. And that's the spirit, I think, in which he's acting. Our queue consists of Doug, Kevin, Carson, Andrew, and Annette. Doug? Yeah, I wanna uh, pick up on things going back to Peter's comment and uh, Joanne kind of uh, touched on as well. And it's, I think the Carrington letter, it, you know, this question of confidence is really critical. And I think it goes to the, a very different understanding of Republican government that Hamilton has that he's, that is part of what's fueling this, this kind of bewilderment about Madison. And, and he uses the word seduction, you know, Madison's being seduced by popularity. And, you know, and, and that end where he talks about, yeah, I'm a Republican, but the greatest threat to the Republican government are the demagogues, you know, and the, and the people who play on these, the, 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 the people's uh, whims and stuff like this. And it comes back to this fear uh, that Republican government is undermined when the people lose confidence in 
the leaders, right? Right, and that, and that the function of Republican government is to make you, he uses the word happiness twice in the, in the Carrington letter early on, that it's the happiness of the country. And essentially, the people's job is to choose people like Hamilton to get into power and then let them do their job. There's not supposed to be this constant oversight, this constant vigilance, this constant supervision by the people. So this is kind of Colleen's point about, you know, this is where Madison's moving in a very different direction. And the, the best um, expression of this, I think, comes in the Kentucky Resolution, when Jefferson, it's almost like he has a, a, a bullseye right in Hamilton's brain, where he says, um, it's a dangerous delusion where our confidence in men of our choice to silence our fears for the safety of our rights. That confidence is everywhere, the parent of despotism. This is, a, this is exactly the opposite of what Hamilton's saying, right? P Hamilton's saying, no, it's the lack of confidence that makes people worry, and that, that that's why they'll rush to a, to a despot. Jefferson continues, free government is founded in jealousy and not in confidence. And that's, that's a very different understanding of, of the people's role in a republic. Hamilton's idea is that the people are there to elevate me, you know, and then I run things to make you happy. It's not this participatory, ongoing, it, that's why he hates the democratic Republican societies. It's one, and if you read the counter resolutions to the Kentucky resolutions, like all, which every you know, state, right, the confidence question comes up again. That what, the reason why you have to censor the speech is that speech undermines leadership. If, if the leaders are undermined, all hell breaks loose, we have chaos, and that's what, what leads to despotism. So there's a very clear theory of Republican government that Hamilton, I think, is, is articulating here, somewhat implicitly, but that it, it goes to a very fundamental difference that's emerging in the 90s about the role of public opinion. Yes, Joanne's definitely right, and I'm, I'm going to go on the or the paradox about Hamilton is he writes so much to convince the people to sit back and let us do our job. You know, in other words, <laughs> I'm writing so you get out of our way, not so I engage you and bring you in. <laughs> Kevin, then Carson. Well, I wanted to come back to something that Colleen said. She said that Madison was concerned with, quote, how the people understood the Constitution they ratified. And I put it to you that this was always how he thought the Constitution should be read. I want to take exception then to something Peter said. He said that people like Madison were concerned with placating anti-federalists. And this is, I think, part of the argument uh, to which Colleen referred, the kind of classic tradition of saying, well, there was this Hamiltonian Madison, and then later there was a different Madison. Um, actually, in Virginia, the people to whom, with whom Madison was in sync in the 1790s had not been anti-federalists. So we're talking about Edmund Randolph, Edmund Pendleton, um, George Nicholas, people who had been moderate federalists, like Madison, in the Virginia Ratification Convention. And their position on the Constitution was, I think, always unlike that of Hamilton at the time of the ratification. So I've devoted extensive attention to the Virginia Ratification Convention. And my conclusion is that the way the Constitution was sold to people in Virginia was actually different from the way that it was sold to people in New York. And Hamilton thought, having been the main salesman in New York, this is what we get. This is what I wanted. This is how I'm going to implement it. What I'm doing is consistent with what the people consented to. From the point of view of somebody who'd been in Richmond in the summer of 1788, uh, what Hamilton was doing was what the anti-federalists had been warning would happen if you ratified the Constitution. And Madison and his fellows, like Randolph, had insisted was not going to happen. So um, I don't think it is surprising that Hamilton ends up being taken aback by the fact that Madison is opposing his system of uh, administration because Hamilton had good reason to think that that was what the people had ratified. I would argue it was what New Yorkers had ratified. So th there's a kind of, there's a classic conceit and you see this both among the Hamiltonians and among the Jeffersonians that there was a kind of consensus from one ratification process to the next, but we have to remember that there were 13 discrete ratification campaigns, and uh, again, I think the most interesting aspect of this 1790s debate is that um, arguably each of the major combatants here was being true to his vows uh, in playing a leading role in 
uh, implement or in uh, adopting the Constitution. Carson and then Andrew. Okay, I'm going to try to say a few things, I think, on behalf of Hamilton. Um, and some of them I'll build on things that have been said by other people. Uh, on the question of Hamilton's indifference to appearances or to the optics, I think I would say something like this. We've talked about political differences, differences of principle, personal differences. There's also just at work, I think, differences in perception of the facts. These guys don't see the same world, and therefore they're not sensitive to the same things. I'm thinking of the fact that Jefferson seemed to think that the real thing to fear was centralized power that would swallow up the states. Hamilton, it's not so much that he thought that would be a good thing as he just thought the opposite was what was more likely to happen. He thought the thing tended toward disillusion. Same thing goes with the fears of him trying to establish a monarchy. If you ask Hamilton about his plans to establish a monarchy, he basically says, that's crazy. No one can establish a monarchy in this country. Um, that would never work. So I don't take that seriously as a fear. So I think he's just not perceiving the same things that the others perceive, and that's why he doesn't pay as much attention to them. Maybe it's not as much indifference to appearances as he just can't believe that they really see it that way. Um, a little bit of a response to Colleen on Pope. Um, I do, the one time I remember Hamilton quoting that remark from Pope, he does quote it, and then he does also say, I believe, this is not true to the latitude that Pope means it. So he is not indifferent to forms of government, although he quotes it to establish the importance of administration. Um, and also on sovereignty, I agree with what uh, Doug was saying. I mean, I don't see Hamilton as viewing the government as sovereign in opposition to the people. It's a manifestation of their sovereignty. I think that comes out in the Tully letter that we haven't talked about, but it's in the reading. And in the other Tully letters where he's mad about the Whiskey Rebellion, because he says the Whiskey Rebels are basically enemies to the sovereignty of the people, because they won't obey the law. Um, it's the government that's the instrument of the sovereignty of the people. Um, and then on the question which has been raised, I think, of constitutional faith. Was Hamilton playing fast and loose and trying to administer the government into what he wanted? You know, there's something to that, but not as much, I want to say, as what some people would say. And I'll read a little bit from the Carrington letter here to, de to defend him. What he says to Carrington is, as to state governments, the prevailing bias of my judgment is that they can be, if they can be circumscribed within bounds consistent with the preservation of the national government, they will prove useful and, sal and salutary. If the states were all of the size of Connecticut, Maryland, or New Jersey, I should decidedly regard the local governments as both safe and useful. As the thing is now, however, I acknowledge the most serious apprehensions that the government of the United States will not be able to maintain itself against their influence. I see that influence already penetrating into the national councils and perverting their direction. And then he says this, hence a disposition on my part towards a liberal construction of the powers of the national government and to erect every fence to guard it from depredations, which is, in my opinion, consistent with constitutional propriety. So I take him to mean there that I actually have concerns that are extra constitutional in a sense that inform my theory of interpretation, but it's not entirely free floating. Uh, he says this in other contexts. You know, there's certain gray zones in the Constitution where you can disagree, and in those gray zones, I'll push for as much as we can get. Um, but that doesn't mean that he's entirely indifferent to the, to the uh, agreement, or he wouldn't have said consistent with constitutional propriety. Um, I'll finish up. I'll say a couple more things on his side, and then, and then let it go. Um, as far as this question of not listening that Michael raised, I, I mean, I think that there's not listening going on on both sides, because when they raise the fear of Hamilton aiming to create a monarchy, they are interpreting everything he does in light of that supposed end, which he denies that he has. And when he denies that he's a monarchist, of course, their response is, we don't believe you, right? So that's a form of not listening, too. And then I think Michael's right that Hamilton's personalizing this to some extent, but it's not entirely unreasonable. What Hamilton says about the bank, I think, is instructive. He says, on the bank, a mighty stand was made, and they lost, and loss is embittering. That's similar to what Jefferson said way earlier um, in that letter we talked about yesterday about, well, this was before, he says, it was different after blood was shed, right? I mean, it's dangerous to personalize these things, and it can make you not listen, but it's also an astute form of political analysis to realize that people are embittered by opposition and are embittered by loss, and that might be driving part of what's going on. Um, and of course, it would be fair to say on the other side that all these things would be true to, of Hamilton as well, although he doesn't admit that as much about himself, but their opposition to him inflamed him as well. Andrew, Annette, and John Rokostet. 
I think when we're thinking about Hamilton uh, and his reaction um, to his political adversaries, it's important to understand that Hamilton is born out of wedlock, and this is something he's deeply sensitive about. He's orphaned at a young age, which he's sensitive about. He's not heir to a fortune, which he's sensitive about. If there's anyone who was primed to be particularly uh, aggrieved by slights, real or imagined, it's Hamilton. But it's also important to note that many of these slights are real, that Hamilton um, is provoked. You know, John Adams says of Hamilton that he was a, quote, super abundance of secretions that he had not whores enough to draw from. Uh, and, and, and I could give you a whole other list. Um, but some of them might be beyond R-rated. Uh, and so, and so I, I think that there's, you know, it's difficult to decouple the, the uh, personal from the political in terms of these rivalries, but I think that it's telling that, ha that Hamilton had such pronounced animosity with John Adams in his own party, and yet Hamilton uh, endorses a Republican to um, swing the election away from Burr in 1800, and Hamilton in 1804 again endorses a Republican um, to steal the election away from Burr for the New York governor's race. And so we see Hamilton um, both fighting within his own party and crossing party lines in ways that you wouldn't necessarily think align with his policy preferences. And that's not to say that the policy doesn't matter to Hamilton, it matters profoundly. Um, but there's this deeply personal element as well. And that... Well, just thinking about everything that people have said until this point, and it was something that I was thinking about yesterday, Jefferson was the most talented politician of his era. And he had his finger on the pulse of something that was happening in the 1790s that ultimately ends in 1800. So the documents that we're reading, the people's expressions of their thoughts and what they believe, and no, I'm not a monarchist, I and mean, of course he would say that, wouldn't he? Um, those are important things, but what's going on at the time is also important. There's a there's a movement, the Democratic Republican clubs. People are taking the view that the revolution meant something and that the revolution meant a change in the society. You could have a well-administered government under a monarch and a first minister. And people could be satisfied in that sense. And many people in the British Empire were satisfied. This was supposed to be something different. And Jefferson had that in his mind from the very, very beginning, that you were gonna make a new kind of society and have a different relationship between the people and the government. And they were not gonna be satisfied with the idea of administration from above. And Jefferson and Madison, together, we know that there are difference, differences in their, their beliefs. They get something, they get it. And they ultimately end up triumphing because they get it. So all of these, when I'm thinking of if Hamilton is paying attention or not paying attention, does he care about the people or not, he doesn't have and would not want to have, as Joanne is suggesting, when he says he doesn't want to be popular. Popularity has to be at least a part of the, uh, the toolkit of a person who's going to be a, a leader in a Republican society, in a society where you have to amass the the, uh, the views of the public opinion. So it's nice to be able to say, well, it, you know, I'm not popular, and wear that as a badge. Um, we don't know, you know, a badge of honor, but there's not much of a chance that you're gonna be able to lead a society or to move people. The astonishing thing about Jefferson is that he gets to be president, and then he has acolytes. There are people who love him, people who love whatever style he has, and he has Madison, I mean, Madison comes after him, Monroe. We have a brief interregnum with uh, JQA for a time, and we're back to Jackson, whom he didn't care for, but who considers himself a Jeffersonian. And we've not had that run of political influence in anybody since then. So for whatever he's doing in the 1790s or whatever you know, problems might exist there, people think of character or whether he is um, condescending to Hamilton, the fact is, he gets it, he gets something, and he's actually able to ride a, his own wave into the presidency, into a political dynasty 
that shapes the early American Republic. And, and as I said, we haven't had that before or since. John. You know, um, I, I'm going to defend the conventional wisdom. I think academics hate conventional wisdom because they wouldn't have anything to do with their time if the conventional wisdom was correct. Uh, I think Madison does change substantially uh, in this, over this period of time and dances considerably with what his positions are. In the mid-1780s, he's very concerned with the power of state governments. He's very concerned with the abuse of uh, creditors by debtors. He's very concerned with the abuse of religion by majorities in the states. He's concerned with commercial rights. He's concerned with implementation of the British treaty, which can't be done because the states are opposing the debts issue. He's concerned with British trade, that we have no ability, we have no federal power, we have no national power. Um, when he gets to the constitutional debates, the ratification, I think Kevin and Peter are, I would agree with him partially, he does become more cognizant of the state's rights argument, but he does not embrace it during the ratification. In fact, in Federalist 39, he makes it clear, he's, he has every chance, and he would make people, he would make the anti-federalists very happy if he embraced that, and he doesn't. He says, you know, the argument is consolidated government versus a league or a compact. He says to Jefferson expressly, this is not a league or a compact. That doesn't work. We tried it. And he says, this is a federal government. It's sort of a hybrid. But then when you look at his list, virtually everything is a national power. And the things that are states' powers, things like appointment of state senator, or senators by the state legislature, we've eliminated. Um, and, and so Madison, um, Hamilton can legitimately say, wait a minute, Madison was a nationalist. Uh, and now he seems to be opposed to me. I think that part of the shift that's going on in the ratification debates, though, relates, um, again, conventional wisdom, more to the issue of checks and balances. Look at what he says in the Bill of Rights. He's opposed to a Bill of Rights during ratification. He said, we don't need it, it would be a mistake. Henry, oh, I've got to bring up Patrick Henry eventually. <laughs> Henry and the Anti-Federalists are saying over and over again, this is a mistake, and they are pointing specifically to the Necessary and Proper Clause. This is not a modern invention. They're saying that's the danger, that and the General Welfare Clause. Those are the dangers. You're going to get expansive federal power. When Madison embraces the Bill of Rights, he says exactly that. He says, you know, he writes to Jefferson, he says, I was never really opposed to a Bill of Rights. Uh, it was just inconvenient at the time because it would interfere with ratification. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's legitimate, and I think that was an honest point. Uh, he also says it's going to be very convenient politically because if we have a Bill of Rights, it'll get these anti-federalists off our backs and we'll be able to govern. But he also says during the debates in Congress that necessary and proper clause. We need checks and balances, not states versus federal government. We need checks and balances in the structure of the federal government that will protect the rights of the people. Um, when he gets to 1798 in the Virginia, he's very uncomfortable with the Virginia resolutions. Jefferson is trying to pull him. Taylor is trying to pull him more toward the Kentucky resolutions. And Madison's going, no. And then he spends the next 37 years of his life trying to deny what he did in the Virginia resolutions and saying, well, no, I didn't really mean that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, you know, there, you know, Madison, who certainly is a complicated person, I think seeing him simply as a Jeffersonian or simply as a Hamiltonian is, is wrong. But I think that he, he uh, does have a shift in this period. Uh, he is pulled towards a Jefferson view, but he never abandons the view of, of um, the necessity of national power. And that becomes clear in the 1799 Virginia report, in which he basically tries to pull back from what they had said in the 1798 Virginia resolutions. Um, Having said, having dropped that stink bomb, um, I, I actually was going to shift something to something Doug said. I think that was very important uh, about Hamilton and Jefferson, and we've, you know, completely. T Annette tries to bring us back to Jefferson. We're leaving Jefferson out to some extent. It, it, Hamilton does have this view. Uh, Doug is absolutely correct that the role of the people is to vote and then get out of our way, um, because the government is going to run itself and it's going to run itself well. Um, that. Jefferson's view of the role of the people and the role in a republic is, is much richer than that. We're sitting here looking down on the University of Virginia. Jefferson thinks education of the populace is critical 
because we have to have an educated populace that's going to participate and keep a check on government, not simply in voting, but by being informed by newspapers. Jefferson embraces newspapers. Uh, Jefferson's embrace of religious freedom is about the republic. It's partially about religion. It's partially about religious freedom. It's partially about it's critically important that people can think for themselves and, and that, that people participate in the republic in an ongoing manner. And so I think that if, if you know, we're supposed to be talking about the, the view of the republic, I, I think that that is a quintessential tension between Jefferson and Hamilton, that Jefferson is very participatory uh, and these things that we sometimes attribute, well, yeah, he has UVA, but that's somehow separate from the Declaration of Independence and the Republic. No, it's absolutely integrated, and the Statute for Religious Freedom is absolutely integrated into his views of how the country is supposed to operate. Before returning to the queue, I want to put uh, another couple of documents before us to think about. <clears throat> In Jefferson's letter to Elbridge Gary of January 1799, he says, I do with sincere zeal wish an invaluable preservation of our present federal constitution according to the true sense in which it was adopted by the states, that in which it was advocated by its friends, and not that which its enemies apprehended, who therefore became its enemies. I am opposed to the monarchizing of its features. Hamilton, in November of 1788, to Jonathan Dayton says, the late attempt of Virginia and Kentucky to unite the state legislatures in a direct resistance to certain laws of the Union can be considered in no other light than an attempt to change the government, which brings us to the Kentucky resolutions. So my question is, does, do the Kentucky resolutions represent Jefferson's understanding of the Constitution that was passed by its friends? And to save time, I won't go into any of the provisions because I know you can all do that better than I can. So back to the queue. Doug, Brad, Colleen, and Carson. Okay. Um, I want to... Um Annette brought up a, a really important point, I think, and again, it kind of goes just to, not to the nature of Republican, but, but also to the, the meaning of the revolution. And I think she's right that Jefferson thought that this revolution meant something in the sense that it's going to lead to this, this new order of the ages, this, you know, we're going to begin the world anew. And Hamilton, I don't think, and this, I'm, I'm, I've been haunted by Eddie's question that I horribly fumbled yesterday. So, uh, I, you know, I think in this case, Hamilton doesn't think America is exceptional. I mean, he's, he's attached to the Republican theory, you know, this wonderful passage in the Carrington letter, but, you know, but I have my doubts, you know, whether or not we can, we can pull it off. Um, and, and again, it comes back to this notion that the only enemy the Republican has is fear in this country, the spirit of faction and anarchy. Um, and that, that he goes, if I wanted to promote monarchy, I would mount the hobby horse of popularity and cry out us usurpation, danger to liberty, et cetera, et cetera. And this would raise ferment. You know, th and then he says, this is the old story. You know, in other words, he doesn't think this is new. He doesn't think what he's seeing in Jefferson and Madison is new. This is what has happened to republics. And the, and the Tully letter that, that uh, Carson brought up is a really good one. You know, who's Tully? You know, he's Cicero. And, he, and the last line is, how long are we going to tolerate these Catalines? It, it comes back, you know, it's this cyclical notion. This, this, there's nothing new. This is the old story. We're facing now these demagogic populists. They ride in the hobby horse. They're promoting faction. And that's what's going to undermine whatever republicanism we can attain. And it's a modest republicanism. It's a qualified republicanism. It's elitist republicanism. It's ordered republicanism. It's about law. It's not about this, the you know, participatory, vigilant, jealous populace. You know, always uh, you know watching over the shoulders of their leaders. Um, that's that's not it, and and I think it does sort of you know point out this other kind of widening gulf in the '90s between those who see the revolution as revolutionary in the in the modern sense, right? And that's not a restoration, right? But we're moving into a bold new world. And Hamilton is no, this is the old story, right? And that that the, you know what we what we hope for are incremental gains and happiness. Happiness meaning material security and legal protection, not um, you know the the 
citizen engagement. You know, that that's not what, your happiness isn't contingent on your being a vital participatory member of the Republic. It's basically of being safe at your home, you know, having your property secure by a, a active government that, that's taking care of you. So just get out of the way. Brad, then Colleen. That's very good, and I, I, I'm struck with Hamilton's, I, I think it might have been the last letter that he wrote, other than the one to his wife, before going out uh, to Weehawken, uh, his letter to Theodore Sedgwick, one of the New England Federalists and allies, and uh, this has to do with a, you know, a pretty minor plot, uh, apparently, by some New England Federalists to create a New England Confederacy breaking off from the Jeffersonian Republic. And Hamilton writes to Sedgwick uh, and says, uh, I will here express but one sentiment, which is the dismemberment of our empire will be a clear sacrifice of great positive advantages without any counterbalancing good, administering no relief to our real disease, which is, and he capitalizes, democracy, the poison of which by a subdivision will only be the more concentrated in each part and consequently the more virulent. Um, on the question of popularity or public opinion, I, I, I don't see a huge difference, frankly, between Madison and, and Hamilton, though I'm open to be persuaded that I'm wrong about that. But, if you look at his speech uh, before the New York Ratifying Convention, the June 21, 1788 speech, he says all governments, even the most despotic, depend in a great degree on opinion. In free republics, it is most peculiarly the case. In these, the will of the people makes the essential principle of the government, and the laws which control the community receive their tone and spirit from the public wishes. Um, it's true, I think, that Hamilton himself didn't much care whether he was popular or not. He just wanted to get the job done. If that would have required that he be popular, then he probably would have tried harder to be popular. But it didn't. All, the popularity that he cared about was the popularity of George Washington, the man who hired him uh, and, and who supported his policies. Uh, and Hamilton wrote often and, and passionately uh, in favor of defending Washington's character against the attacks of, of the Republicans uh, because he understood that the solidity of the government and his so-called administration of the finances at least depended on Washington's standing in the public mind. So it was Washington who stood for re-election, not Hamilton. Colleen, Carson, and Kevin. Well, if Hamilton didn't care about popularity, he'd have a rude awakening today because he's the most popular of all the founders <laughs> by far. It's so ironic. <laughs> it's ironic yeah. um, I want to respond to to John's take on on Madison. Um, you know, it's partly criticism, partly some amount of praise. It reminds me of. Uh, what Mark Twain said about Wagner's music, that it's not as bad as it sounds. Um, <laughs> I don't think Madison, I, I think this idea that of using this category of states' rights, this is just not Madison's category. That's not how he's thinking about this. This is later on with Calhoun and, and sort of reading back on this period. Um, sure, there's a division of power, of constitutional power in the charters. Um, and that's important, it's important. Um, but for, for Madison, it's, it's, we need a stronger uh, national government, sure, but it's still a limited government, um, and that's, that's critically important. But for him, it's federalism. This idea of federalism is a principle for him. It's not, not just a division of power. It actually plays in with, with republicanism to create a new kind of republic. And, um, to see that in Mad Madison worked so hard in the, the 90s to sort of try to lay that out. And I think in the Virginia re resolutions and Virginia report um, that he's consistent with what he says in the 1780s. 
After all, remember the Federalist Papers, I think it's 44, where he talks about the use of the state governments to sound the alarm to the people. That's exactly what's going on in the uh, Virginia resolutions. Now, the Kentucky resolutions are definitely more radical because in the Kentucky resolutions, Jefferson does make a state, one state, um, uh, can declare an act of the national government null and void. The Virginia resolutions n don't ever go that far. And when <coughs> Jefferson asked Madison to take care of him when dead, that's precisely what Madison is trying to, to take care of is Jefferson's statement in the Kentucky resolutions and to moderate that claim because of the danger that that posed when it, in the hands of someone like a Calhoun. And it's very, it's very dangerous, uh, the Jefferson's theory there. Um, on, this, on the question of public opinion, um, here, here's, I don't know if, if this is at all persuasive, Brad, but um, I think, at least from Madison's perspective, the way he sees the difference um, is that Hamilton has this sort of old, this, this traditional idea of, of deference in politics. You put, you put the best people in, and you let them do their job. Doug really summarized this incredibly well. Um, that's Hamilton's perspective. Tocqueville picks up on this and sees that that is a world that's now gone. Um, and, and the high federalists, I mean, let them do, put them in office, let them do their jobs. Now Hamilton, as Joanne said, does appeal. I mean, he's, he's, he writes more than anybody for the public um, because he's in a political battle. Uh, and he has to do it um, to, to try to, you know, keep his policies going. But he doesn't want, he wants to be doing his job. Whereas for, for um, and it is this idea of confidence. Um, so Madison writes a piece and he says, you know, and it's directed right against uh, uh, Hamilton, uh, who are the best, and Adams, who are the best keeper, keepers of the people's liberties? Well, these, these guys, these anti-Republicans, Madison says, um, they want you to obey and, su uh, and submit to the government and have confidence in it. Whereas we true Republicans say watch over the government and then obey the government that is of your own making. So there's this in new idea of this thing called a public that's emerging in the late 18th century um, that, I mean, this is all the rage in France. And you know, this is where Jefferson has been, and he's sending all these books to, to Madison. And it's this idea that we can form this thing called a public that actually has a voice. Um, and it's not just some people in government making these decisions, but there's a way in the new world, because of new means of communication, that we could, over a nation, actually form a people that could govern themselves. And that's the experiment that I think Jefferson and Madison see themselves engaged in. And they think Hamilton either just disagrees with them or doesn't get it. Carson, Kevin, and Joanne. Okay, I wanna say four things. One, on the question of popularity in Hamilton. Um, we've said that he didn't care about popularity. I think that's true, but it could be misleading if we don't put popularity in connection with fame. I think Hamilton cared about fame, but not popularity. You see this in The Federalist. He talks about the executive branch. He says that the love of fame is the ruling passion of the noblest minds. Um, in the report on public credit, which is a state paper about public credit, he openly says, I am highly conscious of the fact that my reputation is tied up with the plan, and I want it to succeed so that I can win reputation. I think he says it in a letter to Carrington, too when he blames Madison for trying to make a maneuver that forced me to resign by depriving me of the real authority I need because he would know that I would not keep a position and sacrifice my chance to make money as a lawyer in a position where I couldn't earn reputation. So I think he would draw a distinction there and he wants the, in other words, if you say he doesn't care about popularity, it sounds like he's just indifferent to what the people think about him. I don't think that's true. I think that he wants, <coughs> their final positive judgment on the basis of his whole career and not just a temporary popularity that comes from flattering their passions, in his view. Um, on the question, the second question I want to note is, we've said too that for Jefferson, the revolution meant something, and that could imply that it didn't mean much to Hamilton. I think there's something there, but the point I would make is it meant something different, right? If you ask Hamilton, what does the revolution mean? 
I think he would focus less on self-government, although I think he's indifferent to that, but he would say, yeah, it means America is an independent nation. And it's going to be a powerful nation and a prosperous nation and a great nation, right? That's what it means. And that's pretty big, although it's something different, I think, than what Jefferson would have emphasized. Colleen made me think about this question of the public, and this actually relates to these two other points. I think the public was important to Hamilton as well, but he's understanding it differently from a like a contemporary public that has a voice. I think of this in, again, on the report on public credit, this sounds like it could be kind of boring, but when he talks about people trying to avoid revenue, like smuggling, he has a little section in there on how you would catch the people who are trying to smuggle. He says, people who are engaged in smuggling or evading taxes, they are defrauding the public, right? And I take it, I mean, you can't exactly figure out what he means by that, but the valence I'm getting from that is that the public is not just the people who vote right now, but it's America. It's the country. The community is this sort of big important thing that everybody has to submit to um, and have to show respect for. I think that's his understanding. Um, and then last of all, I'll say something that may be a little more critical of Hamilton, but with the potential for redemption. On this, He is, I think, and I say that because I'm not sure about this myself, but it's typical for a Hamiltonian to make this criticism of Madison as being inconsistent. But there's a fairly obvious inconsistency to me in Hamilton, which is that if you read The Federalist, and if you read his speeches to the New York Ratifying Convention, he says over and over again, if you're worried about tyranny, remember, the state governments will serve as censors over the federal government and will be able to organize opposition to it. And then when it comes to the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, he says, what are they doing? They can't do this. is a change in form of government. So there's a inconsistency there, and I suspect, although I can't prove this to you, I would hope too, I don't think he's being flat out uh, unprincipled. I think he has in mind a certain kind of role for the states in admonishing the federal government, and he probably thinks the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions go further than that. Um, but at the very least, you could say he is saying different kinds of things in different contexts, and that would be an interesting inconsistency to figure out in his thought. Kevin, and then Joanne. Well, I agree with Colleen that we tend to see this states' rights federalism question through the lens of later developments, especially Calhoun's thinking about these later developments. And that's especially true in connection with Jefferson's draft Kentucky resolutions. We do see the word nullification there, and that, of course, makes us think of Calhoun too. But it's not clear to me that Jefferson knew what, nullif what his term nullification meant. And in fact, in the 1790s, there are two uh, instances where we get a bit of an inkling of what it could have meant. So for example, in 1792, in correspondence, he proposes that Virginia could prevent uh, establishment of a branch of the Bank of the United States in Virginia by establishing a death penalty for people who participate in activities of the Bank of the United States in Virginia. Right, for treason to Virginia. In 1797, a uh, grand jury in Richmond hands up a presentment against Jefferson's congressman, this is not accidental, I think, against Jefferson's congressman for common law seditious libel. And Jefferson circulates a petition here in Albemarle County in which, to which he gets hundreds of signatures calling for impeachment of the federal grand jurors. And then he has a correspondence with his acolyte, the new governor of Virginia, James Monroe, his former law student, about whether a state government should be involved in chast chastening the Richmond federal grand jurors. And Jefferson's answer is, well, OK, it's up to Congress to defend the congressman's right to communicate with his constituents, but it's up to the state government to protect the natural right of Virginians to communicate with their congressmen. So I don't think he had arrived at any firm conclusion. In fact, it's not clear to me that he had only one idea in mind. I think there might have been many different uh, uh, measures that Jefferson would have considered appropriate, um, depending on the situation, um, in relation to this idea of nullification. Um, now, as for uh, Colleen's kind of offhand comment that, well, Madison uh, didn't ever contemplate a single state standing up to the federal government alone because Madison, uh, just as Hamilton invented the Hamiltonian Madison, 
Madison invented the non-Jeffersonian 1798 to 1800 Madison, and how did he do that? Well, he said in, in his old age that back in 1798 to 1800, he had not contemplated a single state standing up to the federal government. But if you read the Virginia resolutions, you see that he says, uh, the states have the right and are in duty bound to interpose uh, to prevent the implementation of the offending policy. And then he says, within their respective territories. So is it not going to be individual states that are acting within the state's respective territories? It seems to me that it is. So I think there's a bit of, Hamilton, of um, mythical Madison uh, being made by the actual Madison. <laughs> because we started this session slightly late, we're going to continue with the panel for a few more minutes. But have your questions ready, because we'll be turning to the audience shortly. Joanne, uh, John, and Andrew will be our final three panelists before your questions. Um, I wanted to um, make two points that are interconnected, and one of them is related to what um, Carson was saying about um, the revolution and what it meant to Hamilton. Um, because it did mean something to him, and I, and I completely agree with what Annette said, and I want to come back to it in a moment, that Jefferson had his finger on the pulse of something that Hamilton didn't trust and, and in a sense, was trying to counteract. I do agree that um, Hamilton thought that part of the meaning of the revolution was that there would be a new country created and it would ultimately be able to stand up on the world stage. But the other thing that he thought was special and exceptional about the revolution and its aftermath was the way in which that new country would be created. And he says it again and again and again, right? Look at, look at this opportunity in which we can deliberate and create a government. That doesn't happen very often. He's, he's a very process-driven thinker, and I think he really admires and appreciates the fact that the process is different about how this country is being formed, and that that's a, a very dramatic window into creating something that he thinks is gonna operate better, and in that sense will be a better government, will be in the model of the old world, but I think that he sincerely was excited about that as something new and different. Um, I do think that he, when he says, and he says it repeatedly in his letters, um, he, he fundamentally, I think, just did not think the Republican experiment would work. And I think he thought sooner or later it's gonna fumble. When he says, I, I'm not gonna try to overturn this Republican experiment, but I'm gonna do everything that I can to push it in the direction I think it needs to go so that it will survive, and that direction <laughs> is, you know, uh, we need a really, really powerful executive, we need a really, really powerful central government. That direction, in a sense, is old world-ish. Um, I think he's sincere in saying he doesn't want to end the republic, but I also think he realizes by the end of his life, the last few years, that he doesn't have his finger on that pulse. And it's really striking when you look at letters that he writes, the last maybe two years of his life, and this is actually a direct quote, um, he says, this American, world was not, this American world was not meant for me. It's a remarkable statement, thinking of everything we've been talking about yesterday and today and all of the work and the time and effort and passion he put into it. At that last moment, he, he calls himself an exotic. He says, I, this American world was not, was not meant for me. He understands that things are moving in a direction that are not the direction he thought that they should go, that they're not going to change course, that, that this nation is not quite what he thought it would be. John and Andrew. Uh, I, I think Colleen is right. Coming back to the uh, Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, I, I agree with Colleen that the Kentucky resolutions are very different from the Virginia resolutions. And the Kentucky resolutions in some ways are much more dangerous concept. Uh, Taylor in Virginia tries to insert the language from the Kentucky resolutions. Madison will not draft what Jefferson wants. Jefferson clearly wants Madison to draft the Kentucky resolutions for Virginia, and Madison won't do it. Taylor, John Taylor of Caroline, tries to insert the language from Kentucky resolutions. It gets defeated in the Virginia legislature. So, you know, there, it, Madison certainly understands that Jefferson is 
perhaps going too far in that. And, and the, the, the point of danger is very real. We shouldn't suggest this is just Hamilton who somehow thinks that Jefferson and Madison have gone off the rails. Washington thinks they're about to destroy the Union. Patrick Henry thinks they're about to destroy the Union with these Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. And the reason, um, and I think Kevin is, is correct, that Jefferson's throwing around, Jefferson, Jefferson does a lot of great things, but he does sort of throw around ideas sometimes that are not fully developed. And so he's throwing around this idea of nullification, and Kevin says, well, he doesn't really know what it means, but he's threatening to hang people in Virginia if they don't enforce the Bank of America. He's threatening to indict you know, grand jurors in the Cabell case. Um, and so you can understand why Hamilton and Washington and Henry are saying these people are crazy. Um, the idea, Brad mentioned, you know, that there was this threat of Virginia was going to arm against uh, the, the national government. I don't think that that was entirely crazy to believe. Virginia was buying weapons. Now, I think Virginia was probably buying weapons for other reasons, but they were building this huge armory in Richmond. They're buying weapons. There are people saying this is going to be to fight the federal government. Um, I think the critical distinction, and it comes back to this nature of republic, and, and I think Colleen is alluding to it, is Madison, and, he, and Jefferson says, you know, what we need to do in these Kentucky and Virginia resolutions is keep open the possibility of going to extremities. And we don't know what Jefferson means by going to extremities, although we can, we can imagine. Madison, after he drafts the Virginia resolutions, writes Jefferson back and says, you know, we're talking about state power here. But has it ever occurred to you that when we say state, it may not be the state legislature, it may not be the state government, maybe it's the people of the state. Back to this, you know, what makes the republic? It's the people of the state that have this power. Um, and I think that that's critical. Going back, I have to bring up Henry again. You go back to the Bill of Rights. When the Bill of Rights comes back from the Congress, and the Tenth Amendment, of course, is the great protection of states' rights, Henry reads the Tenth Amendment and says, we've been had. We, the Anti-Federalists, have been had because when we sent it out, and the way it is in the Articles of Confederation is uh, the states retain all power not expressly given to the federal government. Most historians and political scientists fixate on the fact that the word expressly is not there. There's a second major change that Henry is pointing to. You inserted the people. And the problem with that is if you say that all power is retained by the states or the people, we never know which one it is. And therefore, if the federal government goes off the rail, it may be the people that can respond, not the state. I wanted it to be the states to have this power. But we were had, Madison is responsible. Uh, he, he throws it back to the people. And Henry comes back to this in his final uh, political speech at Charlotte's Courthouse in 1799, where he is making a speech against Jefferson and Madison and against the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. And he says, look, um, he said, I warned you. I told you people that this Constitution was going to create a powerful federal government. I told you that once they had the power, they would use it. I told you that they would abuse that power. You don't like the Alien and Sedition Acts. You got two choices. You either go to the ballot box and you vote and you throw the bums out, which by the way is exactly how Jefferson wins in a year in 1800. Jefferson does not win because of uh, states ignoring federal power or indicting grand jurors or trying people for treason in the states. He wins because of what Henry says. You go to the ballot box and you vote these guys out. And then Henry says there is another option. The people always have the power of revolution. But be careful. That's a very, very dangerous uh, game to be playing. But that's where we're going to be driven uh, if you don't go to the ballot box and solve these problems in that manner. Andrew, and then we're going to turn to the audience for questions. Um, Eddie asked yesterday a question about American exceptionalism, which Doug pick, picked up and Joanne just commented on as well. Um, and to me, the interesting question about American exceptionalism is that it often gets conflated with this question about, is America a model to the world? And if America is playing by these own rule, its own rules that don't apply to the rest of the world, then it seems to me there's a limit to how much it could be a model to the rest of the world. And so I think both of these things have to be true, that on the one hand, um, in Hamilton's view, America is subject to the maxims of history that have been true in other places. And that's why he takes such pains, and we saw in documents yesterday and today, he's referencing the Swiss and the Austrians and uh, the Greeks 
um, and the Dutch. And he sees these things as really relevant. Um, and I think he also does see America as doing something um, novel, as, as Joanne referenced. And so I think that there's, there has to be something, if, if America is to be a model to the world, it has to be because we're doing something novel enough to take note, but we can't be so different from the rest of the world that it can't be applied to these other places. And I think if these maxims of history that he sees America as necessarily subjected to um, hold true, then it must also be true that, that for that very reason, America may be a model for Europe. Thank you, panelists. Again, we have two microphones set up. If you've got a question, step up to a microphone, identify yourself, and ask your question. Uh, Justin Southwick, private citizen, Nashville, Tennessee. Since our republic sometimes seems as fragile today as it was then, who is today's Hamilton, and who is today's Jefferson? Mitch McConnell is the day's Hamilton. Andrew. I, would, I, think, I think Mike Bloomberg is the closest thing to today's Hamilton because he has, he has this belief in the power of government. He's pro Wall Street. And like Hamilton, he's five foot five. <laughs> Hamilton was 5'7", is that wrong? <laughs> uh, can I say one thing on that, though? Yes, go ahead. It seems to me that from a certain point of view, at this moment, there doesn't really seem to be a Jefferson in terms of wanting the federal government to be limited in its power or to even head in that direction. It seems like the passions of the moment are more in favor of using the federal government for certain purposes rather than Pairing back its power or strictly limiting its power. Yes, sir. So, uh, my name is Edward. I'm a student at Hamilton College. Uh, going off my question from yesterday, uh, as to why, uh, as to why the U.S. Constitution remains a living document instead of all the other ones that have fallen around meaningless and just words on paper. Uh, it, it appears to me that Hamilton's concept of a government by the people, but not held by a leash by the people, provides a, um, a state that is efficient and stable and prevents a fall to the tyranny of the masses. And it, when you go to the ballot box, that is when the people can decide whether or not that government was efficient and uh, conducted its job properly. So my question is, do you think that, that Hamilton's vision is what allowed for the stability and uh, continued uh, strength of the American government? Peter? No. <laughs> <laughs> the basic question is one of legitimacy. And getting back to Hamilton's tone deafness, you couldn't plan a better way to subvert his own work in the Treasury than the stance he took and promoted and his, uh, his paranoia about popular participation. Uh, he said appearance is important, and Joanne was good about that. It's, the uh, appearance has to be of legitimacy and you do have to pander to the people to the extent that the people believe that the government is theirs. That's the major shortfall of the, uh, the notion of that space you're talking about, that space within which uh, we turn away from affairs of state. We people don't even bother go to the stupid ballot box. Why bother vote in the end? Uh, the, the fear of the age, you can see it all over these documents, is the fear for American Republicans wondering what this new thing, Republicanism, is. Can you possibly prevent the return of aristocracy? And that the, becomes the, the, the term whereby your enemies are always defined. They're aristocrats. Even Hamilton says that the state people in the state governments are incipient aristocracies. Um, 
The idea that the people can rule requires, as Colleen has suggested, a new notion of the public, a public that's not just uh, stipulated the way Hamilton stipulates it when he talks about public credit, uh, but a public that, that does have opinion somehow in a collective sense. It's not just the aggregate of opinions. I don't know that you can recapture that uh, moment now. I don't think uh, Hamilton's uh, 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 appeal and, and his prescriptions can do us any good at all now. Annette, Carson, and Joanne. Well, it's a very good question. And you're focusing it, jumping off from the point of the Constitution, which Jefferson was, did not participate in, in writing. I would come back to the Declaration, which Jefferson begins to embrace 1790s and by the end of his life that this is what he considers to be a signal contribution to the country. And the, uni the preamble that people focus on, we talked about the grievances yesterday, and a notion of the people that people who were not part of it in began to embrace themselves. And it, the idea of every group of people who are outside of the American polity first using Jefferson and Jefferson's words to make a place for themselves. And, and the Constitution renews, of course, we had a, a war <laughs> that gave us the possibility of re reframing the Constitution to make it more for all people. Lincoln uses the Declaration to give a purpose to the war, give a purpose to the aftermath of the war. I think it's that spirit that has kept America as America, much more so than the systems. And the, those things are important. I'm not saying it's not an important thing. But I, you know, obviously, Hamilton made great contributions to the country. But the thing that makes America the kind of vibrant, dynamic place that Jefferson envisioned, maybe not in the way he envisioned it turning out, but it doesn't really matter so much if you put something in motion, uh, really comes from the Declaration, which ties us to the Constitution that is supposed to be fulfilling those things, that has been a major, the major engine of American stability and also American transformation. Carson, Joanne, and then we'll go to the next question. I mean, I think that Hamilton has a point and Jefferson has a point on these things. I mean, that there needs to be some kind of moderation on this question. I kind of liked what you said. Um, I mean, and I guess I'm trying to grope toward the moderation. On the one hand, if it were really the case that in a pure Hamiltonian republic, people just elect their officials and then shut up and don't do anything until the next election, then that would not really be realistic to expect that in a country that has freedom of speech and belief in equality, believe that you're equal to your elected leaders. I mean, and it wouldn't even be healthy or good either, right? Because they need input. Um, on the other hand, you can reach a state of paralysis or worse than paralysis if you try to have the people involved in the policy making process. I mean, I'm thinking something that I think would not have been approved by Hamilton a few years ago when the Republicans in Wisconsin had a bill they wanted to push reforming public sector unions. The response of some of the unions was to get a bunch of people and go down and occupy the Capitol, right? Um, and there's a real difference of opinion there because the people who were in favor of that said, this is what democracy looks like. I think Hamilton would say, this is what an aggrieved minority trying to intimidate the public officials looks like, right? And you know, it's not wrong for them to do that. They have a right to do it, but it's dangerous because at some point the people who support the governor might figure out, well, maybe we should get a big crowd and go down to the Capitol. And then you're gonna have a recipe for trouble, right? Where somebody's gonna get hurt and, and other bad things might happen. So you know, you have to have the right amount of moderation and strike a balance on these things, I think. Joanne. I think if you asked Hamilton if and how he contributed to the stability of the country, he would come up with one word and that word would be credit. Mm -hmm. Credit meant a lot of different things to him. It, it had an obvious financial meaning. He meant it in the sake of reputation as well, in the sense of reputation, that the, na the nation's reputation mattered enormously. I think he thought that the structures he was setting in place fundamentally were about garnering credit for the new nation and that in his mind, without that, 
there would be nothing. He, he says at one point, I think in the first report on public credit, credit is an entire thing. And I think that's, that would be the Hamilton comeback. That would be the way Hamilton would answer your question. Next question. Yeah, um, it's, it's maybe more a comment than a question, but it might <coughs> get a response. Uh, <laughs> P Peter, I think, rightly picked up on, uh, in the Carrington letter, uh, Hamilton's repeated use of the phrase, my administration. And I think we could do a little more with that. Uh, I think that um, one of the reasons that Jefferson and Hamilton get off on the wrong foot almost immediately is their different understanding of their roles in the government. I mean, Jefferson comes in assuming that he's the first minister of state and that he'll be treated that way and that he'll, he'll be the leading role in running the government. And remember that the Secretary of State at that point has a lot more in his portfolio than he does now. He runs the territories, he uh, runs the mint, he does the uh, patents, he does a whole lot. So it certainly would have looked that way on paper. And then he comes in and uh, Hamilton immediately acts uh, as though he's the main guy. And I think that Jefferson would have found that not just annoying but scary because of what Peter also said, which is that the model that Hamilton is pretty much explicitly following is the British model uh, that became notorious under Walpole and uh, that Hamilton explicitly followed. I mean, there's the, the uh, uh, conversation where he's asked, uh, Adams is asked what the perfect form of government is. And he says, well, you take the British form and you purge it of all of its corruption and that's the perfect form of government. And Hamilton responds, exactly the way it is is the perfect form. If you take away all that stuff, you can't run the government. So he's pretty much explicitly said you need, you need control over finances to have a government that would work. According and to According to Jefferson. But you know, Jefferson, ha <laughs> Jefferson has more reasons than that to think that that's what's going on. I mean, that's certainly the model that he sees being followed. Uh, precisely the idea that the Secretary of the Treasury running it says that that's the model that he sees. So you know, that's just an observation, I guess. Any comments? Yeah, Michael. I think that's a terrific observation. That's my comment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Thanks, uh, Andrew Mingus. I'm a Hamilton alumnus. Um, my question is: it, was, I, it seemed to me from some of the comments, it was very, it's very easy to kind of pit Hamilton and Jefferson against each other in this question of confidence and kind of removal of the populace versus a very engaged populace. My question is, does that all depend on the context of the situation? So for example, if there was a New York resolution during Jefferson's presidency or someone came into office legally that Hamilton believed to be unfit to govern, would he propose you know, an increased uh, role in the populace to combat that? And same thing for Jefferson's presidency. If there was a resolution, would he be as pro states' rights if it was something that went against something he was doing as president? Any response? Well, I, uh, that's, I thought I pressed it. Oh, wrong one. Well, I think you see in a lot of the talk about the parent contradictions. Madison says one thing one year and then says something else, and then Hamilton, and Hamilton does the same, and then Jefferson does the same. I think a lot of it is instrumental. Uh, Jefferson is panicked about the Alien and Sedition Act and was, was horrified by the Alien and Sedition Act. And this is something that goes, other things that happen would not provoke him to that point uh, to do that. And I think you have to look at the context and how passionate and how important the matter is to the people. And sometimes people, we don't do things consistently. You know, I mean, the, the looking, we can look at people, they're, they're dead now, they're not gonna do anything else. You have all their letters <laughs> and you can go through and say, and in 1790 they said this and in 1826 they said that and then they did this and it's this, isn't this a contradiction? Is this a character problem? when it's really a human problem and people are dealing with you know, whack-a-mole, whatever problems coming up, they figure out a way to deal with it at that point. Other responses? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Hi, I'm Tori Stapleton. I'm a senior at Hamilton. And I believe that Carson and Joanna touched on this a little bit. Um, 
like what what would Hamilton say if you were around now? And I guess I'm going to throw out a far-fetched question, which is, if Hamilton were around right now, how do you think that he would perceive today's Republican government? Would he be disgusted? Would he be proud? Um, and how do you think he would perceive his legacy? Would he be excited to be popular? Or do you think that he would be more attached to this fame? Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to speak to that. Kevin. Well, I. I don't know that Hamilton would like the popular pseudo-Hamilton of these days. That is, for example, uh, of course, Hamilton, according to Lin-Manuel Miranda, moved from one colony in the British Empire to another, and that made him an immigrant. Well, I think if you told Hamilton he was an immigrant, he wouldn't appreciate that. Um, I, but I wanted to get back to um, a comment that was made before about the popularity of the government. Uh, it seems to me that the Jeffersonian project of having the people involved kind of fell aside after the Jeffersonians took control of the government. And in fact, the Jeffersonians said in the 90s that they wanted popular participation in politics, but then they intentionally let the Republican uh, Party run into the ground. And so by the time James Monroe was reelected, Correct me if I'm wrong, someone, but I think that the voter turnout in the 1820 presidential election in Virginia was 8%. So nobody voted because nobody cared because it just, there wasn't any conflict. And um, you end up having a resuscitation of popular participation in politics in the Jacksonian period because people are intentionally ginning up issues. In fact, we have correspondence among party leaders actually saying, what could we argue with each other about? <laughs> so this, this, if you're going to have popular participation, you have to give people, you know, you have to give them something to fight about. You gotta give them somebody to dislike. Um, and that, that was, of course, contrary to Jefferson's hope for the future of the government. He didn't want there to be ongoing conflict. He saw his victory in 1801. Um, as meaning the end of this. Now we'll all be back to being a happy band of brothers and we won't have party conflict. So uh, there's somewhat of an ironic tinge to that, but um, I'm not sure what Hamilton would think about this popular Hamilton image we have today that I think in other ways I could name also is not the real Hamilton. Joanne and then Carson. Um, I think, I don't think he would be really happy right now with his reputation. Um, partly because, as I said before, he prided himself on not being popular. Like when he picked pseudonyms for his essays, they were always classical characters who like disdained appealing to the public. So I don't think he would know what to do with this moment. I also don't think he would be thrilled that him being born illegitimate was being sung about on Broadway. <laughs> I don't think that would thrill him at all. Um, I think, um, as far as the current moment, I think one of the things, and it's related to a lot of what we said during this session, that he talks about again and again and again and again is demagoguery. He's very worried about what happens when people appeal to the passions of the people. So I think if he poof appeared here at this current moment of time, he would be saying, look at what demagoguery gets you. The people are all riled up. All kinds of people in all sorts of ways are engaging in passionate, upset debate. I mean, he would look at what feels right now like an unstable political moment, and, and that would be one thing that he would focus on, I think. Carson and Doug. I understood you'd be asking what Hamilton would think about America, right? Um, and would he be proud of this republic? I guess I could think of a few, I would make three points. One is, he wanted America to be a major commercial power, and that happened. So I think he would be happy with that, or I don't see why he would be unhappy with that. This is kind of playing a game, right? Because we don't know. Maybe he'd think it went too far if he were here. But that seems like consistent with what he would have wanted. And then also, comparing him to Jefferson, you know, Hamilton would have to be less appalled by the scope of the powers of the federal government than Jefferson would be. Whether he'd be OK with it, I don't know. But Jefferson had a more legalistic understanding of how the federal government's powers should be restricted. Hamilton, again, 
thought there were gray zones and you pushed the necessary proper clause a long way and the general welfare clause a long way. So a lot of what the federal government does, actually all the entitlement programs are based upon a Hamiltonian interpretation of the general welfare clause, the taxing and spending program power. So he, he is in a way permitted that to happen much later. So I guess he would still recognize this as somewhat the same regime. But picking up on what Joanne said too, I think Hamilton, even though he came from nowhere, had a kind of aristocratic soul. And uh, politics in a mass democracy tends to be pretty vulgar. And I think he would find that kind of hard to take. You know, it, I can't, I mean, maybe he would adapt himself, but I just don't see Hamilton tweeting like, Jefferson has a womanish attachment to France. Sad, <laughs> you know? <laughs> But would he say it for he the public? You know, I don't know. Well, just on, just on this question of popularity, I, I forget if it was Governor Morris or Fisher Ames or after he died, you know, even the, when they're eulogizing, they, I think it's Fisher Ames, I don't know, might, Joanne or somebody might know, but Fisher Ames says, you know, you know he never wanted your approval. You, you know he never wanted you to, he, you know, the, the, they're raising to a virtue that he wasn't, pop, he, he never wanted your endorsement. But you know, you, you, he wanted you to just sort of recognize that he was good. But you know, courting popularity was the antithesis of what he thought he was supposed to be doing. And and but on the other hand, and it came up, uh, somebody raised this, um, you know, that he wanted fame, you know, and that you know one of his damning accusations against Burr is that Burr was has never been solicitous for fame, you know, he just has ambition you know, an ambition without that love of fame, you know. So I think he wanted to be on the $10 bill. Uh, you know, I don't think he wanted a musical where they, you know, <laughs> featuring, the, featuring the Reynolds Affair as, you know, the central act. But, but you know, but I think, you know, so I, it, it's a complicated thing. You know, I think where he, he wanted to be recognized. He wanted to be remembered. He wanted us to sort of acknowledge, I think Annette said it, you know, that he, he was instrumental in the establishment of the republic. But Joanne quoted that letter to Governor Morris, 1802, where he says, this American world was not made for me. You know, and, and that's where he, he knows that his day was done. He's a, he, was a, he was an aristocratic, elitist Republican in a world that was becoming democratic, and, and I don't think he liked that. The final uh, comment for this session goes to John. Um, you know, I, I, I think uh, I want to come back to two things that Annette uh, brought up at, at various times this morning. Uh, the one is, and I'm thinking of Gordon Wood's book, which is about Adams and, and Jefferson, but I think it's also very much about Hamilton in many respects. Um, and what, you know, Annette talks about Lincoln's use of the Declaration of Independence. One might conclude at a very broad level that, uh, you know, we are a Hamiltonian republic with a Jeffersonian soul. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of truth to that, again, at a very, very broad level. We, we want to be Jeffersonians, Merrill P Peterson, you know, we all, and I think Peter Ono at the time, we all want to be Jeffersonians because we, we love his vision for what America is, but we really are Hamiltonians in the way we operate. Um, but I think the, the other thing which uh, Annette said, which uh, uh, give you caution that every professor on the panel I'm sure would agree with, is, is you know, great care in projecting these people 200 years forward to this circumstance. Uh, Annette brought up the Alien Decision Act, and you know, we, Colleen and, and Kevin and I have been talking about the danger of the Virginia Resolutions and the Kentucky Resolutions, which were very dangerous. But uh, Annette's point is a good caution, uh, that Jefferson was deeply concerned about what was going on. I mean, we used to say there were 14 indictments under the Sedition Acts. Modern scholarship shows that there were scores of indictments, dozens, scores of uh, Republican uh, newspaper editors have been thrown in jail. And, and he saw this as a real crisis of the republic. And he, they criticized, the Democratic Republicans criticized Henry, saying, you don't understand what's going on. And I think there's some, some truth to that, 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 they, that because of the circumstances, the real world facts, there was a danger that, that precipitated this uh, actions which we can look back on and say, gee, that was very dangerous what they were saying in response. The, the point being that the facts 
control everything. And so when you try to project Hamilton and Jefferson, and again, I'll finally say something that everyone might agree with, I mean, it, it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. They didn't see a civil war. They didn't see uh, Reconstruction. They didn't see Jim Crow. They didn't see the change in globalization and the idea that you fracking on your own property might pollute somebody's well down the road. They didn't see automobiles and the fact that you have to have federal regulation. I mean, federal regulation of automobiles have dropped someone turn me off to a factor of 20 percent <laughs> since the 1960s so you know the idea that all oh, Jefferson would be opposed to this federal regulation well you know there's a world that he couldn't comprehend nuclear weapons the need for biological the need to have a national health institute so um, and I know you're aware of this but you know we all need to remind ourselves that um, I think it is important to talk in very broad terms, which is why I started out with, I think, a very broad, you know, we're a Hamiltonian republic with a, we want to have a Jeffersonian soul, but uh, a great deal of caution in projecting these people forward. Thank you for your attention, panelists. Thank you for another lively session.